presentation today by Darvin Cogshaw and his other, oh, what is your title, Kathy? <laughs> So uh, I'm the assistant director at our center in gotcha. Charlottesville, and I'm also a master cognitive skills trainer. Gotcha. So we're going to be working our brains, which clearly I need. Um, but I would like to first get started with um, introductions, and I'll just go through my screen here, and I'll start. I'm Angela Keating. I'm the firm administrator for uh, Commonwealth Life and Legacy Council, and we do estate planning and elder law, and I'm the chair for the Aging in Place Business Network meeting. Kathy Allerton, You're, we can't hear you. Sorry, you called on a, let's see. I don't know. Oh, well, that's Kathy Allerton and she <laughs> works. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes to do some announcements. Um, does anyone have anything that they'd like to share with the group? Sure, I would. Okay. <laughs> Sheila with Java, Jefferson Area for Free Aging. And I just want to let everybody know that Java is still taking applications for home delivered meals. Uh, for those first. And, um, and demonstration that we're having today is meant to be uh, dynamic and, and interactive. And so Dargan and Kathy are completely fine with you. Just if you've got a question, wave your hand, unmute yourself and jump in at a pause. Um, don't be afraid to do that. It's not, it's not going to be considered an interruption or anything. So um, we are monitoring the chat. I know that everybody's been leaving their contact information in there, um, which is great. Please do that. Um, but if your question, if you type it in the chat and nobody addresses it, please just unmute yourself and say, hey, I have a question. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dargan and Kathy, and we're going to train our brains. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, Kathy and I look forward to giving you a primer today on the skills that our resource or intervention targets and, and trains. I'll share a little bit about what the scientific evidence, what the outcomes are showing, uh, but I wanna spend a majority of the time allowing Kathy to interact with you in a way that we interact with our students. And by the way, we call everyone a student, whether they're five or 95. And so I, I wanna spend most of the time you getting a chance to touch, to feel, to experience what memory and cognitive training is like, because once you interact with it, you know it's different. You know, you can't describe it, you need to feel it. And so um, just a little bit about me, so you know with whom with whom you know, you're getting your information and dealing. Um, I've been in the Charlottesville community for 20, 25 years. Uh, I went to undergraduate here. I got a, a graduate degree. I've been a serial entrepreneur and early stage guy. Um, I've, I've had some significant successes um, in the form of an IPO with an early stage venture I was part of. I've had some significant and catastrophic failures, um, actually with a, a venture or two being forced to sell to bondholders. So um, I, I, my common thread through my career in this community has been bringing to market things that change people's lives. When I look deep inside myself, that is what I'm good at. That is what drives me. And um, I need to be close to that improvement of, of life. I need to see the impact on people's lives. And so 12 years ago, after exiting one of my businesses, um, I started thinking about what legacy do I want to leave what in, in, in my community. And I knew that legacy had to be about choice and opportunity. I had, I, I went from anti-cancer drug development to web services. I've been in multiple industries because I have a really good education. 
because I'm smart, I, I'm realistic about that. And I felt very blessed um, when I had three neurotypical ch children, started thinking about what am I gonna leave behind? And I knew it needed to be choice and opportunity. I looked at education and I wanted other kids to have the same choices I did. And I looked at education, thought it was broken, um, and got, got in, involved and close to it, but I'm a disruptor. I blow up models. I, I ask hard questions, and there was no place there. And that's when I found Learning RX out of Colorado. And Learning RX is a licensed package of tools and methodologies. And it made so much sense to me that the kids were falling through the cracks in our community, not because we had standardized testing, not because of any curriculum choices or instructional models, but because they had weak tool sets when they went into the, the educational piece. And it made so much sense to me. Why focus on the curriculum, the content, the instruction, if the processor is broken. And so 11 years ago, I brought Learning RX to Charlottesville to help the kids falling through the cracks in our educational system because of certain skill gaps. And so you ask, what the hell does this have to do with you know, memory and serving the aging in place? And, and so I fast forward 10 years from opening the clinic when we primarily we're focused on work strengthening skills in a one-on-one, -on -one, very similar to, this is what my clinic looks like, a gem for the brain. Um, it, now, fast forward 10 years later, we're, you know, half of our, the students we're working with are over the age of 60. And so, what, what we have learned is that people lose their end. You guys are in the industry. We lose our independence today, not typically because of a healthcare issue, because medicine today can keep us alive far longer than, it, than we should, than the quality of life you know, it, it would demand. People are losing their independence in our community because of cognitive issues because they forget the tea kettle on, because they don't look in the rearview mirror and back into the car. And so anyway, it's evolved from just targeting children who couldn't focus, who, who had dyslexia, to now serving a much broader population. And so I want to, I want to share with you the skills. So Kathy, when she's demonstrating, you understand what our procedures, our exercises target and strengthen. So this is the world in which learning RX lives. It's the world of cognitive processing. You hear processing skills, cognitive skills, thinking skills, learning skills. Uh, there are a variety of names for how does our brain take input from our world coming in through eyes, ears, nose, skin, all of the different orifices, orifices, the sensory, how does it take that input and convert it to knowledge? On the front end of our processing skill set is attention. Can you sustain focus? Can you suppress distraction? Can you appropriately divide it, your radar between inputs? Think of tasks like driving, where you're having to multitask all the time. So that sits on the front end of our skill set. So if we can't focus, we don't get all of the input to be able to process and convert to knowledge and then demonstrate to the world. There's something called working memory, which is like the RAM on our computer. It's the bucket. So if I were to give you a, a sequence of tasks, Dr. Jones will see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. It'll be in his Burkmar office. You need to call him at 924-3600 to confirm your appointment. Well, if you're attending, 
all of that information goes into what we call short term or near to working memory. You're holding it there for a temporary period of time while you're thinking about it and using it and doing things or rushing to a post-it note to write it down or picking up the phone to call to, to before the, me the memory of the number leaps out of the bucket. So working memory is like the flash drive. Then we have processing speed, which is fluency. How quickly and automatically does your brain process information? All of these skills impact everything that comes into your world, whether it's novel, new, or it's known. Then we have a higher order of processing skills. Logic and reasoning is problem solving. Your ability to, to see patterns between seemingly disparate pieces of information or missing pieces of information. You hear the phrase, he's smart like a street cat or she gets it from the 30,000 foot view. Probably really strong logic and reasoning skills. Auditory processing skills. Our, our language is an oral language. The codes that we have written down are symbols for sounds. A lot of our communication is auditory, whether we're reading silently, speaking you know, vocally, you, you can hear it. So how well does your brain do in processing, not physically hearing, but processing input that comes in auditorially? It's a really uh, strong uh, underlying skill for reading proficiency. Visual processing, can you use your brain as a blackboard? Can you see things in your mind's eye? Long-term memory, and this is probably why, this is the hot button. Long-term memory is like the hard drive on your computer or the filing cabinet. It's the compilation of all of your crystallized knowledge, things you've learned in your life, experiences you've had, emotions you've felt, and how robust is that hard drive? How well organized is the hard drive? And when the world demands of you, like the task of Dr. Jones will see, oh, that's my internist. Oh, I know where the Burtmar office is. I recall his number, 924-3600. Can you go to that hard drive and pull off things you've already learned and things that you have invested in? So learning RX, the, so these skills are how we function every day, not just in learning environments, not just in classrooms with kids, but how we function every day in our life. And when one or more of these skills is deficient, think of them as a tire on a car, goes flat, then certain tasks that require those skills are harder than they need to be. So that's this is the world in which our resources and tools target and strengthen. Um, I wanted to show you, can you guys, did, do you see this? Did my screen just switch? Can everybody tell me it did? Yes. It so, did. so let's talk about these skills over a lifetime. And this diagram is a beautiful example of what happens to those skills as we age. So unfortunately, it, these are all the varying thinking skills that I just told you about. And this is, the, this is our age, if you think of age on this axis. Um, you know, somewhere between our teens, kind of late teens and mid twenties, most of our core cognitive skills are at their peak and it's, you know, it's reasonable. We, we were designed to fight, to breed, to harvest, to hunt, all of these things kind of in our earlier years. And then later we lose our ability to procreate and breed. We, you know, become not in a, as an important member of the group and our cognitive skills follow a very similar pattern. There's an age related you know, decline in our skills over time. And these are neurotypical. 
this doesn't, you know, kind of model if you are to be, you know, you have a progressive disease state like dementia or Alzheimer's, you will see that the slope is even more dramatic. But, you know, what is interesting to me, what this shows is that we retire at exactly the wrong age when biology is working against us and declining our skills, we actually should be engaging in stimulating things. We should be, you know, we should be doing things that actually enhance our skills. So this gives you an idea of kind of what the normal age-related decline looks like in a variety of these skills. So learning RX targets these skills, strengthens these skills, so that age-related cognitive decline doesn't have to be a necessity so that we can strengthen and position ourselves that, should, God forbid, we contract a progressive disease. We have more cognitive reserve in the bank with which to draw the disease can draw down so that we are functioning at a higher level longer in life. So who, who knows, who's ever heard of mild cognitive impairment on this call? MCI. So mild cognitive impairment is the first clinical state someone progresses into that is beyond age-related kind of normal cognitive decline. It is typically a precursor to a dementia or Alzheimer's, but not everyone who is diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment eventually ends up in one of those more aggressive disease states. But recently, the American Academy of Neurology put out guidelines for all neurologists in the country for treating mild cognitive impairment. Who can guess what the two things listed in those guidelines were? Two things, that neurologists are ethically required to discuss with their patients who come in with mild cognitive impairment diagnosis. Has someone responded? I Go would ahead. say their um, activity as far as um, how engaged they are with uh, activities, with learning new things, you know, something like that. Their engagement. Okay. Who's got another guess? Great answer. How about socialization? Okay. Are they involved with other people? Social. All right. Great answer. I will add challenge. Uh, so physical challenge where you're raising your heart rate uh, and strengthening cognitive function and cognitively challenging activities like crosswords, learning a new language, et cetera. Great. That's a per So Graham, you get the good bingo. So in, in the most recent guidelines by the American Academy of Neurology, and they are, by the way, the closest people to God on earth because they, they believe they're got, they're they, they control the brain. And so the newest um, guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology, let me, they list two things. They list physical exercise. The evidence is solid that physical exercise is cognitively stimulating, enhance, and, and the second thing they mention, cognitive training. Guess what there's a lack of evidence for? Pharmaceutical interventions. The memory drugs do not work. And so neurologists today are required to mention getting on an exercise regimen, and cognitive training. Now, we know there are other pillars, things like socialization, 
think, and, and I think the American Academy of Neurology, they missed a perfect opportunity to discuss diet and a no, low neuroinflammatory diet. But socialization, I heard that. Engagement and cognitively stimulating activities, I, I heard that. I, I think low neuroinflammatory diets, I, I, I think, what's the commonality in all of these things? They are lifestyle choices that we control versus say a pharmaceutical company. I'm not anti-meds, but what we're learning about cognitive enhancement and, and, and stimulate and, and maintaining independence longer in life is that a lot of these things can be within our control. So what does the scientific evidence show? Last thing before uh, Kathy shows you, like, so why does this all matter? Why are these people coming to learning RX? Why are they cognitively or, or why are they doing cognitive and memory training, one-on-one -on -one training with us? And I'm going to show you what some of the peer-reviewed evidence shows, and I'm going to jump very quickly. So let's go to the mild cognitive uh, impairment. A lot of our research is in the area of MCI and the impact of brain training on MCI. And in this journal article that was published a year and a half ago, I just want to show you. Can everyone see this slide? You can see this slide. So this is a case study in which five clinically diagnosed MCI patients went through a study and we, we used, and I use we, it was an independently funded study by a researcher. Um, they used the MOCA, which is an assessment tool. Some of you on this call took the Gibson test. It's another cognitive assessment tool. And prior to a nine month trial, they measured their baseline. And the scores here, you have to score 23 or 24 in order to get a mild cognitive impairment diagnosis. So it's based on your demonstration on an objective clinical assessment tool. And all of the subjects were clinically diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. This individual had full-blown Alzheimer's. They were then put on a physical fitness program for three months and a low neuroinflammatory diet. And the assessment was administered again. And you can see not no regression and actually some improvement on their ability to demonstrate at the second testing. Well, then with the low neuroinflammatory diet, with the exercise, the 30 minutes of exercise five times a week and the one-on-one -on -one cognitive training, six months later, the assessment was administered again. Four of the five subjects at the conclusion of the pilot study were no longer qualified for a mild cognitive impairment diagnosis. And the full-blown Alzheimer's case who was told to get her affairs in order after nine months was actually demonstrating at a higher functional level. Now, the researchers make us present the evidence this way, but the most compelling thing to Kathy and I is that our clients are reporting engaging in their world in a very different way. Confidence to go back and open a business or finish a book, or it's really about how this transfers to everyday life, which is our calling. And you know, for those of you on this call who, who are serving the aging population, we want to keep them independent and not needing of services. So we may be in conflict with your business, but our calling is to give people choice and independence so they can age and do 
and enjoy life longer. So any questions about the skills, kind of the evidence, how, how we measure improvement? Because I want to turn it to Kathy to give her, you know, the, the rest of the, of the time to demonstrate how do we get these gains? How do we target these skills? Um, I've got a question. You'd mentioned a couple of times about um, low neuroinflammatory diet. So can you uh, elaborate on that just a little bit? Well, it, it's, it's low process, low sugar. Um, I'm not a dietitian and I don't want to take much time. I mean, I can, I can share with you the international functional medicine, the diet these people were put on, but there are much better professionals on guiding the nutritional approach to this. But for, suffice it to say, low processed food, low sugars, you know, whole foods, and th that is kind of the summary of the diet these guys were on. So the, the fact that you want to bring down inflammation is important, is what you're saying. Basically, correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. Inflammation in the brain. I mean, and you know, the guys from the Alzheimer's Association on the call, they can share with you with what the research shows about that. But controlling inflammation in the brain is essential. Okay. And Thank I was going to say, dental health is very important as well. So gingivitis and those kind of things being treated for that is important as well for inflammation. Yep, I've seen the evidence for that as well. All right, any other questions in the chat that I haven't picked up on? All right, Kath. I think, Kath, I think Graham ahead. was asking about the end, the number of subjects or participants in that MCI study, and I think it was five or six cases. In the in pilot that. study, mm -hmm. and, and this was on clinicaltrials.gov, there is an application to uh, the, the NIH for a larger expansion of that study currently right now using this. This is a, lar a much larger N. This is 262 clients, but again, showing pre and post differentials in where their baseline assessment came in and then after the intervention of training. And all of these are clinically significant different demonstrations of potential. And so, yeah, it, 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 we have 17 peer reviewed journal articles. I just picked out the one that I thought was cool because it combined other lifestyle pillars. This is just pre and post training. So. Thanks. All right, Kathy, how do we do this? So uh, go ahead and if you would stop your share, please, Dargan. Um, so if you all um, can recall kind of the learning model that Dargan showed you where we start at the front end with those active processing or executive functioning skills, attention, working memory slash short-term memory, what Dargan called the bucket or the RAM on your brain, as well as your processing speed. I'm just gonna kind of take you through those skills in that order, the way that we process information at a basic level and then into the higher processing and show you drills or activities that we do that train each of those skills, okay? Um, so let's start off with attention because if you don't attend, you can't do anything with the information. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and show you one of our um, primary attention drills um, I'll let you know for context in our cognitive skills program, we have about 26 different, different drills or procedures, and they all work a combination of different skills, nothing in isolation because, well, you can't do any activity if you're not paying attention to it. So everything works attention, but some of them are particularly geared towards focusing on attention like this procedure. We call this one attention arrows, although half of the page has what anybody in psychology can tell you is also the Stroop test where you have text of words printed in different colors. Um, so you can do a crazy number of different activities that challenge your brain with just um, 
you know, these stimuli on this page. So let me give you an example. Um, and I'm gonna switch my view so I can try to see everybody in gallery form. So if anyone would like to jump in and try this, just experience some of the drills, that's more, you are more than welcome. We, we highly encourage that because then you can actually feel kind of the brain burn that our students would feel. Okay. Kathy, so, what did you say? What's the name of this test? Uh, this particular um, drill or activity, drill, um, one of our procedures we do in training is called attention arrows. And those are just, you know, the names that we've assigned them to just our different IP things is just kind of vaguely descriptive of what it works on. But everything works on attention. And this one also works very heavily on processing speed, which you'll see in a moment. So is so, someone going to try it? Yeah, I one mean, of, one of our I, participants. I'll I'll explain what you need to do first, and gotcha. people okay. can because <laughs> no. people might want to know what they're getting. I guess I should pay attention, like you said. No, okay. no, it's all good. <laughs> all right, so um, let me show you a pretty simple uh, task. So you could, for example, um, you could look at the first, or rather, the bottom three rows of the arrows, and I could say, okay, please tell me the colors of those arrows, and go as fast as you can. So, you know, maybe someone could do that in 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 15. So you got someone who's really kind of cognitively smoking. They could really do that in about 12 seconds. They could run through there and tell you those arrows super fast. Maybe even so with the directions too, right, left, up, down. So you could do that. Um, what else you could do as, and that would be working something like your, your sustained attention. We think of three layers or levels of attention. Your sustained attention is how long can you focus on something for a long period of time? How long can you listen to someone kind of giving you a lecture without kind of mentally wandering off? Um, then there's another layer of attention, um, which doesn't come up as much during pandemic times when you're kind of trapped in your house. But if you're in the classroom with a bunch of other people, if you're at a noisy center, with a bunch of other you know, seniors who just want to chat and not listen to the lecture, how do you block out the distractions? That's a form of attention too, called selective attention. Can you pick or select what to attend to in the moment and suppress distractions around you? So if you were just crushing this, if you were running through the arrows, um, let's see. Um, do we have a volunteer to do that simple task? But I might throw throw um, a wrench in the works there. Does anyone want to raise their hand and give it a whirl? And I'm going to try to test your selective attention while you're telling me the colors of the arrows. Anyone? Bueller? Anyone want to give it a whirl? I mean, I could always make Dargan do it. He does this for fun. So Dargan, why don't, you, why don't you show us? Angela said do she does. Angela? Okay, great. Angela, thanks for playing. So Angela, <laughs> you see that blue box around those bottom three rows of arrows, right? Yeah, except for I got to get you away from the arrows first. Okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. So what I'll ask you to do is look at those same three, um, you know, those same three rows. Uh -huh. And usually in Zoom, I have an annotate tool um, that allows me to do stuff to the screen like doodle and such, um, mm -hmm. which I'm looking for now, which I don't quite have. Let's see. Okay. But I can distract you other way. So Angela, Start with um, the the bottom, the so the third from the bottom, that yellow one. And would you start telling me the colors of the arrows as fast as you can go? From left to Ready? right? From left to right, yes. Ready, right. set, go. Yellow, green, blue, yellow, da, red. Da, 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 da. Yellow, blue, green, yellow, purple. red, blue, For red, serious, purple. green, blue, yellow, blue, oh, wait. blue, wait, um, I think green, we need to stop red, at yellow, red blue, and really green, stop at green red, too. Yellow. Good, nice. So I was trying to give her some visual distractions. And if you have the drawing tool, you can draw like bunny ears or like write other words and text on the screen that really is trying to distract them. And hopefully they're a good sport about it like Angela. Angela, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that's actively making you suppress something. And what we like to do in our sessions is make sure we're doing something where you get the smile, you get someone they're obviously listening to you, but they're still able to do the tasks. So both they are doing the task and working out their brain. This is a pretty easy task, but they're also, you know, working on that selective attention. You can tell the inputs going in 
and they're choosing not to really, really primarily focus on it. It was really hard when you first started it. It was distracting me until I could get it out. Yep. So yeah, that was kinda, super cool. And yeah. everybody, I challenge you to do these things. Volunteer, please. Yeah. So Kathy, I have a question. Yes. If you hadn't warned her, do you think it would have been different that you were going to distract her? Oh, that's a good question. Um, typically when we start that relationship and we work one-on-one -on -one with all of our students, trainer, student, whether it's in person or in zoom, we might do that without warning the very first day. And then they'll stop and be like, are you, are you kidding me right now? And then we'll tell them, okay. So, or, and, and then we'll say, okay, I'm going to level with you. I could do this at any time during any drill. And now, you know, you could ignore me pretty much most of the time, unless I, I really am like tapping on the table or like, okay, actually pause. Um, so we do tell them I could be working your selective attention at any time during any drill. Now, as your trainer personalized on helping you with your skills, I know some drills are going to be really, really hard for you. And I'm probably not going to distract during those drills without warning. But other ones like attention drills like this, I've told you from day one, there's sustained attention, selective attention, and oh, by the way, divided attention. And this could be coming at you at any point in time because the real world is a distracting place and you get, don't get to choose when distractions happen or don't. Maybe cruising down the road, no traffic around you. You're like rocking out to the music and a deer jumps in front of you. <laughs> and were you too distracted by the song to react or not? So good question. Um, yeah, I might throw that at people. I might give them warning, um, but generally they know to expect it. And um, I think she, Angela might've been a little more like, whoa, what happened um, if I didn't give her warning? But typically we, we level with students on that pretty soon. So um, I'm gonna describe another more complicated complicated task. Um, so if you look at the first three rows of the text below, you see what you, the words green, blue, red, but they are printed in other colors that don't necessarily match the text. Um, and so what um, the task would be here is I would like someone to work on their selective attention because it's baked into the task. I would ask my student to say, can you tell me the color of the ink? Don't read the word, read the color of the ink. All right, so I'm gonna look at my gallery view here and see if I have a brave soul who would like to do this on Facebook Live and in front of everybody, challenge their selective attention. Um, anyone raising a hand? Oh, come on, I heard the chamber was bold. Come on. <laughs> Don't make me do it again, y'all. Michael. <laughs> Ah, Michael, do it. cool. All right, Michael, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming on down. So the task is look at those first three rows of uh, words. And I want you to tell me the color of the ink. Try not to read the word. After the first row, if it's okay. going well, I might try and distract you. Okay, go okay. when you're ready. So just the top three rows. Correct. Okay. All right. Blue, yellow, black, blue, green, yellow, green, black, Blue, green, black. Uh, could really go some for some gold. Green, right red, now. black. Really like their everything. Blue, red, red. With like all green, the yellow, like teal red, green. and the garlic. Nice job. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Thanks for playing. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think I was very quick. I was tough. That is a great point. You did, you actually did, I would say quicker than average for someone sitting down and just trying to do that because our brains don't really work that way. Once we know how to read, our brain is like, pick me, I know, that's red. I've known it for years. I know, I got it, I got it, I got to tell right. you. And you're like, no, sorry, I don't, I don't want to hear that right now. Um, so you're right, Michael, um, we can make that faster. We can always make anything faster. Well, actually one of our primary uh -huh. tools for training is a metronome because we can set the metronome to a certain speed and require you to give your answers at a certain speed. So right now we've been talking a lot about attention, that, that first pass of information getting into your brain, but your processing speed also underlies everything that we do. And you know, if you can get the answer, but you know, it's, you've gotten the answer when you've gone home and the lecture was far over, that's not so helpful, right? 
So how do we drive processing speed as we make people do these tough activities at a challenging but not impossible speed. So I'm gonna turn on a metronome beat and it may come through to varying extent through your speakers, but this is a pretty typical speed. We have some, we have our folks answer at every other beat. So if Michael were doing the same three rows and the same task, same three rows, color of the ink, it would be blue, yellow, black, blue. I like how you're doing it along nice. Yellow, green, black, blue, and so forth. If that's easy, we could make it faster. If you are a person who's impulsive, we can slow it down and force you to operate at the rhythm demanded of you. If you're, you're someone who interrupts, can't wait their turn and things, we can do whatever is challenging for you. So you can think about folks who have slower processing speed, we can work to speed them up. If you have just not a great grasp of your attention and keeping track of time and, and paying attention to cues, we can slow you down. So we've only done a couple different things here, um, but we can take it up to the next level. We can look at divided attention where you're splitting your attention between two different things. When you're listening to somebody and taking notes, that's divided attention. When you're having a conversation and driving, that's divided attention. The way we can work divided attention is tons and tons of ways, but we could look at the arrows and you could alternate color of the arrow, direction of the arrow. If I were doing the bottom row of arrows, that could be blue left, red right, blue up, red right. And I could have my trainer distracting me at the same time. So divided and selective and sustained all in one go. We could really amp it up, take it up to the next level. You could look at the words and you could say the color of the ink and then read the word. Do we have a brave soul who would like to do that offbeat? Just do a couple rows of working their divided attention, color of the ink, then read the word. So I'll give you the first two answers. You would have blue and then blue right off the bat. I'm looking for somebody's hand being raised even almost against their will. Like Come on, possessed. Andrea. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I love when people throw each other under under the bus. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so so I'm reading the word, the color of the first word, and then the next word. That's right. The color of the ink first, and on the next ink. one, read the word. Color of color. Color word. of ink, then word. Color exactly, of ink, then word. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Color of ink, then word. Okay. You got it. Blue, blue, black, yellow. Yes. Green, no, yes. what? Color? You're right, you're right. It's right. green. You got it, you got it. <laughs> Go. Green, red, color of word. Green, yeah. blue. Yes. Blue, yellow. Black, green. That uh, one's red. blue. That one's blue, but you're doing blue. a great job. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, this you're is almost there. Okay. And then Gr color of word, then we're okay. Green, black. All right. That blue. Green, you, yeah, yeah, let's stop. You can keep going. I, I won't stop you because it is kind of fun, right? Right? No. <laughs> Once you get the handle, a handle on it. Andrea, thank you so much. That is the most complicated thing we've, we've asked anyone to do today. So thank you so much for, for playing. So you could imagine, yeah, and she did a great job. You could imagine doing that on beat. Anyone want to try 120 every other beat? Yes, yes. I mean, we don't, I, I don't have time to train all of you all day. But anyway, so. That's one way we can be having your attention worked like crazy, plus your processing speed. And I can make it faster if you're crushing it and throw distractions at you. Or if it's a challenge, we can work on one row at a time. Color of the ink, just work on, hey, I know it's, this is a really tough task, but let's get that pattern going in the back of your mind to help you. Color, read, or ink read whatever works for you so wherever you are we can train you to do something you can't do and we consider if you sit down we give you a task and you can't do it right away and you practice it and stick with it enough and then you can we consider that to be built skill you couldn't do something and now you can we feel like that is the manifestation of neuroplasticity at work your brain changed you couldn't do something and now you can 
any questions about any of that so far? Because this is just one attention drill. Let's do a memory drill. Let's do a memory. Yeah. All right. Everybody's all about the memory. I understand. I understand. <laughs> so I'm going to stop my share. And um, I see there's some stuff in the chat. Um, okay. 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 All right. So I'm going to show you a short term memory drill. And then we can make it a little more complicated and take it into not just short term, but into working memory. If y'all can see, oop, I need to get rid of my. Mm, I don't usually actually have a a, uh, a uh, background on. Just revealing my secrets here, um, so it's blocking out my card. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Dargan, can you grab your uh, some memory digit cards from yep. the under the pencil sharpener there? See my long term memory. I know where all this stuff is. It's like I run the center or something. So. Mm -mm -mm. So what we're going to do is a drill where Dargan's going to hold up a card um, up to the camera and it's got digits and blanks on it. Awesome. Thank you, Dargan. So the way you would read that card is you would say blank and can you point as we go across the row, Dargan? You would say blank, seven, blank, 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 four, blank, blank, two. So there's a grid there. And each location on the grid has either a blank or it has an actual digit in it. So the next card we would read, it was um, blank six blank, blank blank two, four blank blank. Thumbs up if that makes sense. Seems pretty clear. Okay, great. So now um, what Dargan will do is he'll show us a brand new card for three seconds and then he'll turn it away and we'll recite the card. So I'll model that. Dargan, give me a card, please. Right, go. One, two, three. Okay, so that was eight blank blank, blank blank nine, blank blank two. Cool? Cool. So um, we can do this on beat where you have to count while you're looking at the blanks and the, the numbers on the card. So working divided attention in there already. Um, and then you have to recite it at a certain pace too, which means you have to hold it a little bit longer. If we make you hold that a little bit longer, we're working your memory because instead of you just spitting it out as fast as you can, you're stretching how long does it stay in that bucket, that short-term memory or working memory before it trickles out. All right, we could go up to, to cards with as many as six digits on it or four or five digits to challenge that. Um, does anyone want to try a three-digit card? Dargan will hold it up. Dargan will hold up a three-digit card um, and let somebody recite the blanks and numbers. It's pretty fun once you get the rhythm. Any, any other, anyone who hasn't tried one who wants to give it a whirl? Emily? <laughs> Alrighty, cool. All right, go ahead, Dargan, count it out. One, two, three. Blank, blank, seven, five, blank, blank, nine, blank, blank. Awesome. Nice. Great job. Ooh. Awesome. Good. So now, um, depending on who you are, if that's easy for you, if you're cruising through before we go up to the next level, before we go up to four digits, um, you know, I might say, hey, Emily, at the end of the card, um, tell me a Star Wars character or something that Luke. you could list. <laughs> yes, great, great. Or something that you care a lot about is something like, tell me the name of one of your grandkids. Tell me the name of, um, you know, somebody you play bridge with, somebody that, you know, you remember from high school. Um, so we could be bringing in something that's really personally relevant to the people that we're working with, to the student, um, to kind of, you know, bring in a whole nother social level because they just love to like, wield their knowledge of Pokemon or people that they know or like their, their favorite plants to garden with. Um, so here's how we could take this up another notch. So Darkin, can you display another card for us, please? Thank you. So we could change the direction you have to read the card. So Darkin, show us a different direction we're supposed to remember the card in. So just guide your finger across from like, yeah, so if Darkin's having us go in uh, instead of uh, left to right, right to left. So this time we would read it blank, blank, 
blank two, seven, five, blank, six, blank, blank. And he might, you know, show you that, show you that direction at the same time. Okay, what did it say in that order? That's your working memory because instead of going with the default left to right row by row direction, we're changing that up a little bit. We could um, say, okay, read it in this direction and add three to all the numbers. Yes, yes. So however easy it is for somebody, however challenging it is, we can scale it back. We can kick it up a whole nother notch. So if you're, you're making faces about this, yeah, we train everybody no matter where they are uh, because it, it's, it's, it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be challenging. You keep, don't get growth unless it's challenging. Zarkin, how many digits have you been up to in, when you've been doing some training? I'm currently six digits on the card, looking at it at three seconds and going in different directions, adding a random number. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Some perks to being the, the, the center or <laughs> owner. You get to get everybody to train you. Nice. Overachiever. For sure. <laughs> well, it, no, it, I've worked up to it from, uh, like Kathy said, we meet you know, it, we may have some individuals where we start with what is the one number you saw on the card? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. And, and I just happen to be at a stage in the program where I'm enhanced. I'm looking for and I'm building the most cognitive reserve as I, so I, when I age, I'm functioning it. But in re we work with stroke, we work with post chemo cognitive impairment, TBI, and the realities are that may be where that client is. And yeah. we start there. So we have a saying, there is no good or bad. You just are where you are. You don't have to stay there. And so we don't compare. I mean, I only say that because Kathy asked me where <laughs> I am, but we, we have everyone in our clinic is at different levels, but we're all celebrating success and we're all moving to, to different places. And, and you can see everybody in the world is trying to solve problems with this, right? Yeah. Why? Because it's cheap and it's scalable. But Kathy being the clinician, the trainer, is motivating you to go well beyond your challenge levels. Like if this gets hard, guess what you do? You check Instagram and Facebook, like, you, <laughs> like I'm out. But Kathy won't let you shut down. Kathy keeps encouraging you, showing you progression. It's all about, change is all about self-efficacy. If you see that you started with three cards and in a month and a half with us, you're doing four cards at a different direction, you know you can change. You know you can improve. And so sharing the feet, giving the immediate feedback, showing the progression, celebrating the wins. And then the next time Kathy pulls out five digits, you don't go, oh God, I could never do that. Like, that's terrible. You don't lay back, you engage. And it's the engagement that works the neural pathways. That is why the clinician delivered results are so much better than lumosity. Yeah, there's just it's that. a human connection that we all grow from. Yeah, as someone mentioned before, you you have that socialization built in, which is another part of maintaining just a healthy cognitive and general healthy love lifestyle is that social connection with people. And you have a coach who's been with you every step of the way and knows your shared history. We started at three digits and we were there for a long time and now you're at four and that's a huge victory for both, of, for really you. And they feel like it's due to you, the trainer, but you just remind them, you're the one who did the work. I was just holding the cards. Um, I'd like to show you all a long-term memory drill that's very, um, very much uh, one that our folks enjoy a lot. Um, this is what's called a, a rebus, which is a picture that stands for information. Um, what you have across two pages are the names of all our 46 US presidents represented in picture form and they are in order connected one to the next. I'm not allowed to share all of them with you because you're not students, but we can look at the first 10. 
together and I can show you, if you don't already know the first 10 presidents, you can learn them in about the space of two or three minutes by looking at these weird, sometimes good puns and sometimes not, I'm sorry, um, pictures. So we've got first here, a man who's watching something over his head. What is it? It's a ton. So yeah, he's nervous. He's watching a ton, which sounds a little bit like Washington. Notice now that the ton is connected to the next figure. It's a woman and her head is not like a human head. It is a picture of an atom. And that reminds us of our second president, Adams. So we've got Washington Adams. And you notice this is kind of more of a narrative than just, okay, I'm going to sit here and think about Washington Adams, Washington Adams, not auditory rehearsing. This is a bit of a flowing visual story where everything's connected because why do we go to the movies? Our brains like pictures. So we've got um, Adams patting the hat of this boy. He's her son. And how is he dressed? Professional cook could be called a chef. So folks here in the Blue Ridge area should know Jefferson sounds like what president's name? Jefferson. Sometimes the puns are good and sometimes you get what you pay for. Okay, so Jefferson is grilling a son. Is the son happy or mad about it? He is mad. So mad son sounds like Madison. So you see kind of how it's working here. Next to Madison is a man rowing through those solar waves. So man row sounds kind of like Monroe. So take a look at those pictures. Look at them for like three more seconds here. Washington who's holding it. It's Adams patting the hat of her son, Jefferson Jefferson grilling the mad son and who's rowing through the waves coming off of Madison is Monroe. So surprise, if I stop that share, who can say the names of those five presidents forwards if you didn't know them or if you came to this Zoom meeting? Anybody? Anyone want to do them backwards? Just look at the connections. It sounds weird, but if you think about Monroe, it's the most recent one, right? What was Monroe rowing through? The waves coming off of, I saw Graham, you unmuted, thank you. Yeah, sure. Madison, Jefferson, Adams, and Washington. Cool. And did you know those first five presidents before this meeting? Uh, at one time I knew them. If you'd asked me who was the fifth president before we began, I probably would not have retrieved it from long-term memory. Cool. Awesome. And all right. Thanks. That was awesome, Graham. Thanks. And um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, another thing I, I didn't point out in the moment there was there are numbers on every five presidents too. So I didn't point out this detail, but Monroe has a five on his hat. And typically our rows end with the 10th or a, a, uh, a multiple of 10. So you can actually figure out really quickly on the fly who was the X or Nth president based on their position. Like if I remember, spoiler alert, um, that um, Buchanan is the 15th because it's a blue cannon with the five on it. I know Buchanan is connected to links to a letter N O. Right, Lincoln was the 16th president. So you can find out the order of them too. Kathy, now, yeah. real quickly, Emily yeah. has posted a question in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, she said that the test that we took, um, who's the ideal client for that test? So the Gibson, I'll answer it. I was typing it in oh, the good. chat. Okay. But uh, Emily, the, the, the Gibson test, which you took is a, standardized cognitive lifespan test. So the, uh, the data set against which an individual's performance is judged ranges from five to 95 years old. I happen to think the test does a better job if it's kind of more eight to nine years old to 75. I mean, if you think about it's reflective of the US population, the demographic of the US population. So it is a lifespan test. And yes, 60, 65 year olds, there are plenty of those in the normative data set against which a 60 or 65 year old test taker would be compared. So it is appropriate. Um, I, I'm not familiar with what bedside assessment uh, 
physicians may be, I'm, but I'm, I'm certain it's not as thorough as the 45 minute assessment you, you guys did, but um, also do you ever have students who exhibit issues with left versus right? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Go yep. ahead, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes, and that those can be children or adults who keep that uh, kind of hidden um, and kind of cope um, and, you know, have found ways to kind of manage or, or, you know, strategies to help them. And, you know, for an adult, we can decide, is this something that we need to address? You know, it's, it's your training is what you want out of it. If you aren't coming across or you aren't having a problem, if there isn't pain in your life because right and left isn't super solid for you, we don't really need to train it. If it is something that is causing problems, you're trying to navigate and right and left are not the way you want them to be. That's something that we can work on. You notice on our first page with the arrows and color word, color word, there's a bunch of arrows there. I've used that page or even pages full of left, 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 right, 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 to drill and instill more automatic knowledge of that with, with students of various ages. So yes, if it's weak, if it's a problem and it's cognitive re cognitively related, we can try and train it. Good question. So to, so to put a wrapper on things, cause I know people have to go, we don't do thing, we don't train people for the sake of training. Who the hell cares about numbers on a card? Who cares about directions of arrows? I only care that you can do it with your brain. And everything we do is goal-based. So the goals are never, I want to get eight out of 10. I want to do, the goals are I don't want to keep forgetting my car key. I don't, I want to be able to remember names if I'm a widow of people who are calling on me to ask me to tea. I want to remember their name. And so everything we do is about how is the weird colors and the president, the extra, how is that transferring to your everyday life? That is why you know, we do radio advertising. That's the only advert, but we're full refer people are coming because of everyday life improvements. They're telling other mothers or their other parents or uh, of the changes. And so uh, we are constantly asking for, or is left and right getting better for you? Are you, uh, how, how is this transferring to everyday life? Is and your is your word retrieval better? Do you yeah. like, participate more in conversations because you're not- You raise your hands. And, and, and so that's what this is, is all about. And, you know, we would be very happy with any clients that, that you think could benefit from stronger processing skills so they can maintain independence longer. Um, we would be happy to talk with them because all of us on this call know when you go into a memory care unit, you don't come out. It doesn't, it doesn't reverse. It do, you don't come out. And so everything we're doing and in combination with the resources and interventions you guys have are keeping people enjoying the life they have. And we just work on the cognitive piece. We don't work on the exercise. We don't work on the nutrition. We're just one piece and we're not curing anything. We're not preventing any, but in combination, the evidence is becoming clear that we can function at a higher level, longer in life with higher quality. That's what all of this crazy stuff is all about. But we put it in a nice game-like wrapper with a good trainer who's motivating you. And it, the scientific evidence is growing that we can control our outcomes. And I thank, P any other questions? I know you guys have to get it to work. You've been very patient with us. We'd love to 